I'm Antonio Sala, and in this video, we'll start the discussion of the manipulability analysis in a robot. For simplicity, we'll just stick to a MATLAB example of a planar robot with no gravity, but of course, the ideas can be generalized to other configurations. In this first video, we'll discuss robot modeling, the meaning of the Jacobian, and the interpretation of the singular value decomposition of such Jacobian. In forthcoming videos, we'll define the so-called manipulability ellipsoid and we'll carry out further simulations and animations. The modeling step can be basically summarized in the figure we are seeing now. We'll define three symbolic variables, theta1, theta2, theta3, and all those three angles will be stacked in a vector to be called Q. Later on, when discussing kinematics, we'll speak about the vector of angular velocities dot Q. So, everything will start on how the position of the different elements of my robot is determined from the angular positions of the links. So, theta 1, 2 and 3 will be this angle of the first articulation, this angle of the second articulation, and this angle of the third articulation. But of course, the orientation in an absolute frame of the second bar, let's say, will be theta 1 plus theta 2, and likewise the orientation in the absolute horizontal vertical frame of the third element of the robot will be theta 1 plus theta 2 plus theta 3. The end effector will be the end of the last segment comprising the planar robot highlighted with this red cross and we will be interested only in its position x, y and not in its orientation because well maybe we have some tool or whatever which can rotate in that end effector or well maybe just orientation is meaningless for the task this thing must perform. So, as we are only interested in these two features, x, y, of my end effector, then this planar robot can be considered a redundant manipulator because it has three degrees of freedom, but we just have two specifications on what to do in the end effector. Okay, so once we have this statement on what we want to do with this three-link robot, which is the position of the end effector? Well, if we start with the first articulation at the origin, then, okay, this joint here will be at L1 cosine theta1 and L1 sinus of theta1. And then the articulation here will be at position this one, x1, y1, plus L2 sinus and cosinus of its orientation. But, okay, its orientation in the x, y, axis is theta1 plus theta2, so this is x2, y2, and likewise, if I add to x2, y2 the terms L3 cosinus and sinus of this orientation of the last link, then I obtain x3, y3, which is the position of my end effector. So with this model, still no dynamics, no time derivatives, it's just trigonometry, I will define these constant parameter values and the model equations will be just writing in MATLAB code what I was handwriting on the figure. In order to have everything lumped together in a big vector of stuff for later symbolic computations, I'll stack all them in this all articulations stuff in here, just a bunch of trigonometric expressions. And well, as I will also need numerical computations, not only symbolical, then I will use a compiled version with MATLAB function. So this all num is a function of the three angles that when input three numbers, then I get six numbers out, which are the x, y coordinates of each of the articulations and the end effector. And well, I will also add 0, 0, 
because that will be convenient for later plots. And well, the end effect of position, I will give it special name, such as R, or whatever you wish. We'll start analyzing this pose as our operating point in which we wish to analyze the manipulability. So, if I evaluate all articulation positions for that pose, well, I'll have these points here that can be easily interpreted when plotting. So, I will zoom it twice because, well, I later on add more stuff to the plot, so a big robot will make figures prettier, but okay, it's just cosmetic. And then if I plot these all articulation positions, multiplied by two, but it's just the articulation positions, then here we have the pose under study in which we wish to analyze manipulability, whatever it is. So let us go with defining what the hell that manipulability is about. So the basic idea is that if I have some function x or y later on, you know, function of these angles, this q, then its time derivative will be that given by chain rule, the partial of f with respect to each of the arguments, 3 in this case, in here, times the actual time derivative of these arguments. So this summation of partial derivatives time velocities will be summarized with this expression in which this is a matrix of partial derivatives which is usually called Jacobian first partial derivatives and this is a vector of the speeds of the arguments of f which in our case as q are angles this will be a vector of angular speeds so let us particularize to our problem the thing we wish to compute the velocity is x and y of the end effector, which I called R. So I will have three partial derivatives of x with respect of the angles, and then other three partial derivatives of y with respect to these three angles. So I will have a Jacobian matrix, which in my case will be arranged in this 2 times 3 matrix of partial derivatives, which is this Jack R, just a bunch of trigonometrical expressions that I don't care what they are, because, okay, MATLAB handles it. And as I said, dot Q will be, well, the angular velocities of each of the joints that can turn, and if I am doing, you know, kinematic control, then these angular velocities will be my manipulated variables. So by changing these angular velocities, I will try to move my end effector to whatever position my application needs. So in summary, Jacobian is the matrix that multiplied by the angular velocities in my joints gives me the linear velocity in x, y coordinates of my end effector. Good. So if I compile this symbolic expression with lots of trigonometric expressions to a numerical function with MATLAB function and I evaluate it at the chosen pose, then this is the Jacobian we are looking for. The next thing we are going to do is scaling. Why? Well, it's just for convenience. Okay. If each joint in here has a different motor or gear radio or whatever, then maybe the maximum speed of each joint is different. So we will introduce some normalized coordinates, scaled units, let's say, so that the maximum angular speed is 1 in these scaled normalized units. So the actual physical units will be obtained by multiplying the normalized speeds by the scaling matrix. Good. 
in this case. I will just say that the last of the links can have 1.5 radian seconds of angular speed maximum and the other two can have one. It's just a bit I invented that. So, after scaling, we'll analyze the singular value decomposition of this scaled Jacobian and we'll start interpreting its meaning, but we'll defer the graphical interpretation of that meaning for the next video. So, we carry out the scaled Jacobian, we carry out its SVD, and now let us consider which are the inputs and outputs to this scale Jacobian. The inputs are normalized joint angular speeds and the outputs are end effector speed in physical units because we have no scaling in that side of the equations. So the output of this thing has units you know, of meters second. So good. This means that scale Jacobian is equal to U S V transposed and V transposed are the input directions. So it has units of normalized angular speed. So it will be the angular speed maneuvers that produce an effect in these output directions which have, you know, dimensions of Cartesian and effector speed, but okay, I mean, they are just a direction because the units are these gains in meter second per normalized angular speed. So then these meter seconds are in the directions given by the columns of U. So each of these numbers is the description of the so-called principal maneuver. So this is principal maneuver one, which means that when we move the angular speeds of my motors at the joints in these values, then I will have an end effector speed of seven, roughly, meters per second in this direction. So this is the modulus and this is the direction vector on which this speed is happening. So this will be the high gain principal maneuver and this will be the low gain principal maneuver saying that when I move in this direction my angular speeds, this direction is orthogonal to the first one, then I will get an output speed of 2 meters per second in this direction. So this will be the second principal maneuver and we'll have the so-called null maneuver because my manipulator is redundant because I don't care about the orientation of the end effector link so I have one extra degree of freedom and then moving the angular speeds like this will produce a zero speed so this is zero and it has no direction in my end effector. So this is the null maneuver, corresponding of course to the null space of the Jacobian. And these principal maneuvers will have a graphical representation like this, with some 7 meters per second high gain maneuver, some 2 meter per second low gain maneuver, and some null maneuver the detail on how this figure is obtained will be left for a sequel video. The last thing of interest in analyzing my Jacobian is the condition number, which we have down here. It's 3.4 and it's somehow reasonable. It means that the quotient between the high gain and low gain maneuvers is 3.4 and okay. We may consider that to be reasonable, at least in comparison with other configurations close to singularities, in which this condition number can be 30 or 30,000. 
So we'll end the video here. In summary, we have modeled a planar robot. We have discussed the meaning of the Jacobian matrix, which is the one that multiplies angular speeds in my joints to give me Cartesian speed of my end effector. We discussed some scaling and the singular value decomposition of the Jacobian gives me the so-called principal maneuvers with the highest possible gain, the first column of this stuff, so that it will move my end effector at maximum speed, then the orthogonal one, which will move my end effector at minimum speed, let's say, and then a third input direction due to the redundant degree of freedom, which will move the end effector at zero speed. It's the null maneuver. Condition number is something that we must also look at because excessive condition numbers amplify modeling errors or indicate a very different behavior of my robot when moving things in one direction versus another. Condition number gets extremely big when we approach singularities. These singularities, animations and graphical representation of all this will be left for the next video. For the moment being, we end the video here. Thanks for watching.